Okay, hello ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to talk about the last lecture for the first semester and that's on protein translation. DNA is like a book of instructions that has been written with an alphabet consisting only of four letters, A, G, C, and T. Merely knowing the letters, however, doesn't tell us how the genes work. Each gene is a linear stretch of DNA nucleotides that codes for the assembly of amino acids into a polypeptide chain. DNA can be transcribed by using one of its two strands, they unwind first using that DNA helicase, as a template upon which a complementary stand of RNA is built. The path from genes to proteins has two steps. Transcription, in which molecules of RNA are produced on the DNA template in the nucleus, and translation, where the RNA molecules are shipped from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and are used as templates for the polypeptide assembly. Remember, polypeptides are also proteins. There are three classes of RNAs. mRNA travels from the nucleus to the ribosome and is created during the process of transcription. rRNA combines with proteins to form ribosomes in the nucleolus and tRNA brings the correct amino acid from, to the ribosome from the cytoplasm and pairs up with an mRNA code for that amino acid. RNA subunits look very similar. Their, their nucleotide, nucleotides look similar, except the sugar is ribose. It's deoxyribose in, in DNA. The base uracil only occurs in RNA, and thymine only occurs in DNA. So cytosine, guanine, and adenine are the same for both types of nucleic acids. And RNA is single-stranded, and DNA is double-stranded. Because DNA is too large to leave the nucleus, the program that it codes must leave the nucleus instead. The program is transferred to the rest of the cell using the intermediate of messenger RNA. mRNA is like DNA replication because DNA unwinds and polymerase makes copies of the pieces. However, transcription is unlike DNA replication because the mRNA transcribed does not have a fully workable code when it is first transcribed. It must be modified before it is useful. Because thymine doesn't exist in RNA, each time an adenine shows up in the parent strand of DNA, a uracil is paired with the adenine on the mRNA transcript instead of thymine. Much of the DNA does not code for the proteins. Some eukaryotic DNA has long non-coding portions called introns. They must be cut out and have all of the exons spliced back together to make a properly functioning transcript. Scientists knew for a long time that there were 20 different amino acids. However, there are only four nucleotide bases that is the only variable part of DNA. So how can combinations of four different amino base codes for 20 different amino acids? Because if one base coded for one amino acid, you'll only have four as a result. If two bases coded for an amino acid, you'd only have 16. And if three bases have an amino acid, then you'd have 64. That's more than the 20, so that's what they've determined is going to be um, the code. So they're called triplet codes. So the genetic code consists of 61 triplets that specify amino acids and three that serve to stop protein synthesis. Each base triplet in RNA is called a codon. AUG spe specifies methionine, but at the beginning of its sequence it's called the start codon, and you can only start with AUG. And with a few exceptions, the genetic code is universal for all forms of life. Transfer RNA is a specialized form of RNA used to carry specific amino acid to the ribosome and place it in the proper position. tRNA contains 80 nucleotides in the form of a clover leaf. The tRNA must attach to the correct amino acid itself in the cytoplasm and then take it to the ribosome. Ribosomes are made up of two subunits. It must be produced in smaller parts so that it will be able to leave the nucleolus and enter the cytoplasm through the nuclear pores. The two subunits bond together during protein synthesis. When it's not in protein synthesis, they kind of live apart as two components. 
the mRNA travels to the ribosomes, and at the ribosomes the process called translation occurs in which the mRNA code is matched to its complementary tRNA, which is carrying the amino acids. So translation is a process of protein production. Okay, so let's take some practice. Here's some DNA codes, TAT, GAC, and CTC. We're going to do first the practice of the codon. So the codon matches the DNA in its complement. So T would bond to A, A would bond to U, and T would bond to A in the first box. So AUA goes in the first box. The anticodon is just the complement to the mRNA, so it ends up UAU. When you look up the amino acids, you look up the, using the codon. So AUA, you look at the first base, so A gives you the third big row. The second base is U, that gives you the first column of the third big row. And the final base is A, that gives you the third smaller row, inside the bigger row, inside the first column. So that's isoleucine is the amino acid for that one. GAC would bond to CUG for the mRNA codon. The tRNA anticodon is GAC. And when we look up CUG, we get leucine. The final DNA is CTC. That bonds with the mRNA codon of G, A, G. The tRNA anticodon gives you C, U, C. And the amino acid, when you look up G, A, G, you get glutamate. Make sure that you can do this. I guarantee you it will be on the exam, so it is important that you practice with this material. DNA happens in a lot of different movies. For example, it happens in Gattaca, um, and that's about genetically engineered humans. And if you notice the title of the word Gattaca, um, it's all DNA codes. G-A-T-T-A-C-A, -T -T -A -A, those are only DNA codes. Another one is in Jurassic Park. Um, they talk about genetically engineering dinosaurs. In the first Jurassic Park, if you pay attention, there's a scene in which one of the velociraptors, which, by the way, boys and girls are actually Utah raptors, not velociraptors, because they're too tall. But anyway, when one of the velociraptors breaks into the central command area, she's listening for the people that are crawling around in the air ducts above her head. As she pauses to listen, her DNA sequence is being flashed against her skin, and you can see it there. Unfortunately, there's no good picture of that that I could find on the internet, sadly. Okie dokie, so let's do a quick overview for you. Transcription creates an mRNA code in the nucleus. The transcript is then modified, and introns are removed, and the exons are kept. Transcripts leave the nucleus through the nuclear pores, and the transcript moves to the ribosomes found in the cytoplasms or on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The ribosomal subunits join together. The transfer RNA units move into the ribosome sites and match or don't match to the mRNA transcript. If a match is made, the tRNA leaves its attached amino acid behind, and the amino acid joins the to the previous ones. If a match is not made, the tRNA basically bounces out of the ribosome and gives the next TNA, tRNA a chance to try. Once a stop codon is reached on the mRNA, the amino acid is finished and it's in, into its final protein shape. Okay, so if you remember my talk about alleles, you'll remember that I talked about mutation and how that's the source of genetic variability. A gene mutation is a change in, t in one or several bases in a nucleotide sequence in DNA, which can result in a change in the protein synthesized. In the case of these squirrels, it's a change in the melanin pigment. 
Um, by the way, the squirrel on the right hand side you find an, on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls. They're all black. It's the same species as the one on the left, but due to a random chance of being separated by the glacier that cut Niagara Falls, the black ones reproduced and so you have all black ones on that side. Some common gene mutations include base pair substitutions. Spontaneous mutations can cause things like sickle cell anemia, which is the result of a single base pair substitution. This places valine as a 6-amino acid in the hemoglobin chain instead of glutamate. So every so often you can get a base pair substitution. In a frame shift mutation, there may be an insertion or deletion of several base pairs, causing a misreading of the mRNA during translation. So you can see here that as they go down, they are changing, um, changing the sequence just because of one inserted pair. Frame shift mutations tend to be deleterious, which means tend to be not functional. Sometimes base pair substitutions work just fine. Certain types of factors can be called mutagens because they cause mutation. <clears throat> Mutations can arise because of sp spontaneously while DNA is being replicated, but fortunately, usually special enzymes correct most of the mistakes. But mutations can be caused by mutagens such as ionizing radiation like gamma and x-rays, ultraviolet radiation, and chemicals such as alkylating agents which act as carcinogens. If a mutation arises in a somatic cell, it will only affect the owner of that cell and will not be passed to the offspring. Because remember, somatic cells are produced by mitosis, and so it just gets it just gets passed down by just gets passed down to its daughter cells. However, if the mutation arises in a gamete or in the uh, germ cells for those gametes, it can be passed on and thus enter into the evolutionary arena. Either kind of mutation may prove to be harmful, beneficial, or neutral in its effects. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that completes the semester's worth of lectures. I wish you luck on your semester exam, and if you have any questions, you give me a, uh, an email or see me during office hours. Have a great day.